Happy Sabbath, church family. Please, please stand with us and sing uh, My Maker and My King, number 15. Good morning, Father, and happy Sabbath. We're grateful that you've seen us through another week and that you brought us here safely to your house yet once more. We want to invite your presence here, and we ask that you would be uplifted and glorified this day. We pray that you be with those who are not here and could not make it due to circumstances. And Lord, we pray for those who are on their way. May you bring them here safely. This is our prayer, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome and happy Sabbath. Thank you for coming and joining us here at the Piedmont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we pray that you are blessed as we continue our worship service. Our offering this week is for Conference Advance. Our church uh, belongs to the Central Union Conference, and the local conference is a sisterhood of churches that helps each congregation accomplish important objectives that are beyond the reach of any one church. One of the largest portions of the fund goes to Christian education. Another portion of conference advance is set aside for local evangelism to finance programs most local congregations cannot shoulder on their own. Elementary education, child evangelism, academy operations, your monthly union magazines, summer camps, and youth evangelism are also supported by the conference advance offering. All of these educational and life-changing programs are possible because individual members choose to contribute a suggested amount of approximately one to two percent of their income to the conference advance offering. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for the Sabbath and thank you for this church. May we be grateful and multiply the funds for the larger projects of our church. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
as they're heading back, we're going to have a couple of announcements. And first off, I'm going to give the mic over to Jason. Hi, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So I'm here to tell you guys about an epidemic that's going on in America right now. The epidemic is with our United States veterans and what they're going through. We've all seen the newscasts and news articles about what's going on. But I'm gonna tell you that it's happening in Nebraska too. One fact about Nebraska is 59 young Americans from Nebraska have given their lives since 2003 in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yet last year in 2017, 87 Nebraskans, veterans, committed suicide. So that's the epidemic that's going on today. And it's a problem. It's a real problem in America right now. And it's not just in America, it is here as well. I am a veteran and I have been on that side of things. I have seen what these men and women are going through. I've been through them all. And I've heard too many stories. So I wanna tell my story and get it out there. And I think I've found a way to help these people, to help give them hope, to help give them support, and help give them a purpose. And I'd like you guys to come out, not this Friday, but a week from Friday, on August 10th, I'm gonna give a talk. And I hope to see everybody there. And we can learn together on how we can help uh, these young Americans. It's Vietnam vets, Iraq vets, all vets, even peacetime vets are having a problem with this. So please come out and listen to me talk, and I hope to see you there. Thanks. Oh, man, thank you so much, Jason. Once again, that's going to be happening August 10th at 7 p.m., and you can look in your bulletin for the further details as Jason's going to be sharing his story and wanting to start a ministry that will be ministering to veterans and so even those who have served need serving too amen so thank you jason have you moved or changed your number the office would like to know just in case if you would like to have us stay in touch with you if you need updates from uh, emails or if you need to be in touch um, with us and we need to get in contact with you it's nice to have updated information so if you have changed address or phone number and you would like to update that please let the office know and uh, we can update that in our system as well um, if you haven't yet, I've been informed that we still have a card in the back um, that needs to be signed for someone's birthday, uh, Virginia Fulton's, and so we just ask that you go back and uh, sign that and um, take the opportunity to um, just wish well wishes upon her. Also, CVA has a couple um, volunteer opportunities coming up in the near future, and one is near as tomorrow, tomorrow from 9 to 12 at the school, the academy, they're going to be having a work bee. And so if you would like to help volunteer and contribute um, in giving back to a, a place that gives so much of itself to our children, um, you have that opportunity from 9 to 12 tomorrow at CVA. They are also looking for drivers who would be willing to give of their time to drive to Omaha to pick up kids who are driving from Omaha to CVA to attend the academy. And so they're looking for drivers. And if you would be interested in that, contact um, Brian Carlson, the principal of the school. And they're also looking for opportunities. If you want to be involved in the classroom, they have opportunities that they can help facilitate where you can be involved being in the classroom, being with the kids, helping out in uh, a certain capacity. Let them know if you have any interest in that. Once again, contact Brian Carlson for the, the further information. And if you haven't registered for classes or if your kids haven't registered and are thinking about and are going to register, do so as soon as possible. I was told that school starts the 13th. Summer is coming to a rapid end and it just seems like where is time is gone you know and so those are the opportunities that are available that you can help give back to College View Academy and now I invite you to stand as we continue our worship service as we sing to God in song and praise
Let's sing hymn number 85, Eternal Father Strong to Save. Our second song will be I Sing the Mighty Power of God, number 88. Sing, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, the first verse, and afterwards, please kneel with us for prayer.
Good morning, church family. Shall we pray? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for another Sabbath, another opportunity to gather, to fellowship one with another, and to be edified and enlightened from your word. Thank you for the ministry of Piedmont Park Church. Pray that you would continue to bless and strengthen it, that it might make a difference for your kingdom in the Lincoln community and to the far corners of the earth. We think of the Peru Project and thinking about the Peru Project, I am reminded to pray for a group of Spanish language classes from the Eagle and Waverly High School who are visiting in the nearby land of Costa Rica. Lord, we pray that you would bring them safely home. We pray that you would show us your will and your way in the days ahead. We know that the time is short and that your return is close. So may we be about the Father's business of winning souls and carrying out your great commission. Pray for those who operate as team members in our ministry, each and every one. And we'd like to remember those who are unable to be with us today, those who have special needs for prayer. Think of Paul Manistar's father, Jean, Bev and Mel, Pat, Doreen, Garn, Shelley, and Dale and Holly, and others whom we've heard about that are not printed on the program today. We pray that you would bless them and be present with them and minister to each need as only you can. And now as our service continues, we pray that you would bless and anoint Pastor Caleb as he brings us a message about honesty as God's policy. We'll give you all the praise for you are worthy. We pray in the name of our precious Savior and soon returning Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. This morning's uh, scripture reading is from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 21, verse 1 to 2. I'll be reading out of the King James Version. It's 1 Samuel, chapter 21, verse 1 to 2. Then came Na David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? And David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee. And I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Good, and thank you to everyone who has played a role in today's worship service. I've been blessed. Have you been blessed so far? Amen. Amen. Well, it's a beautiful day today, and I'm excited that the week has come to its peak here to Sabbath, and I'm excited to see what God has in store for the rest of the day, even in this moment. But before I continue, I just want to have yet one more word of prayer because I love prayer and I always feel my need for Jesus when I come to the pulpit. 
Jesus, I want to thank you so much that you've given us the opportunity yet once again in another week, Lord, to come and freely worship you. And Father, we ask that you would be uplifted and glorified. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move upon our hearts and our minds and open our ears and open our hearts to hear a word from heaven's throne. And we just ask that, Lord, you would speak. Not I, but you. This is my prayer. I pray in your name. Amen. So I came across a story this week, really amazing and true story. The late theologian uh, Erhard Hassel tells a story that after the second, um, toward the end of the Second World War, Hitler's troops had invaded Austria and the German army was out to annihilate the Jews. And out of compassion, a Seventh-day Adventist woman began looking after a 12-year-old Jewish boy named Fritz. And all too soon, that fateful day arrived when the Gestapo showed up. As she opened the front door, a direct question was fired at her, calling her by name. A soldier asked, Mrs. Hassel, do you have Fritz in your house? What should she say? Should she tell the truth or mislead these murderers? I mean, the life of an innocent young boy is at stake here. What would you say? What should your answer be if you were in that situation, harboring the life of an innocent person? You know, this is a question that I've asked myself, and I know that probably some of you, if not a lot of you, have probably asked yourself this same question, or maybe you've asked other people this question. Maybe people who are older, more experienced, or Bible scholars, or bi people who had a close relationship with God, trying to find a direction of what you should do in such a difficult circumstance where life and death is on the line. Would it be permissible to lie in order to save yourself or someone else? And especially when we come closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus, we're told that persecution will take place, we'll be persecuted, and all these things will take place, and our lives will be at stake. Family members, friends, and we may find ourselves in a very similar situation as this young boy and this lady. Should you lie to protect yourself and others under the circumstances of life and death? Turn with me to our scripture reading, if you haven't already. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 2. Last week, we talked about David and Goliath, that story. And more specifically, we focused in on David and his older brother, Eliab, and talked about criticism and the effects and the negative effects and how much damage it can cause. And yet, David gets through that situation, and he comes out victor, conquering the giant. And it was from that day that Saul kept David close to himself. And we're told in the next couple chapters that Saul keeps him close and they come back from fighting with the Philistines and women come out and they start singing, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And it was right at that moment that Saul started to resent David. He did not like the sound of that song. He didn't like the chorus. He didn't like the tune. He didn't like the lyrics to that song because that meant David was better than him. And he started to resent David for that song. And we're told that David starts to begin to behave wisely in the sight of the king and in the presence. And we see the attempts of Saul to try to kill David by sending him out to go find a dowry by killing a whole bunch of Philistines in hopes that he dies because the king was requesting... Uh, anatomy parts of the Philistines as a dowry to marry Michael, his daughter. But David comes out victor, and he brings back more than what the king had requested. And it frustrates Saul. And then we get to the point where David has to flee because Saul throws spears at him, and David escapes for his life. And he talks to Jonathan about the situation, and eventually David flees because Jonathan tells David, it's not safe. It's not safe for you to be around my father. He wants you dead. Which brings us here 
to chapter 21, David as a fugitive running from the king. And it says, Now David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one is with you? So David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has ordered me on some business and said to me, Do not let anyone know anything about the business <laughs> on which I send you, or what I have commanded you. And I have directed my young men to such and such a place. David is running for his life, and in the fear of the moment, in his uncertain circumstances, David runs to the house of the Lord, which isn't a bad place to run to, amen? Amen. He runs to the place of the Lord, trying to seek refuge, but upon arriving there, he's asked why he's there, and what does David do? He starts to lie. Wait, is this the same David? He just defeated a Philistine, right? David begins to lie, and he came to the house of the Lord for refuge. Have you had a bad week, a rough week, and you, you want to come to church expecting to tell people about it, but you haven't built a relationship and you don't tell anybody? Or how many of us are struggling with some type of sin, have heard there's strength in community, but we fail with being transparent? David runs to the house of the Lord, and even there, he still doesn't feel like he can be transparent enough to share his struggle with running, fear of his life. Now, some of us may say, well, it's kind of justifiable, you know? His life is at, is at stake. And plus, didn't Rahab save two Israelite spies? I mean, come on. You know, and we try to use some of these stories to kind of justify maybe telling a lie in this circumstance would be allowable and tolerable than in this circumstance. Well, firstly, with David, though he's the God's anointed, does not mean it excludes you from the possibility of lying, nor does it exempt you from sinning and lying to people. You don't get a privilege just because you're the Lord's anointed. God's law isn't, you know, changeable. He gave the Israelites the law that says, thou shalt not lie, right? Bear false witness. And plus, secondly, why would you look to a pagan harlot for your example of morality? Now, don't get me wrong. There are people that we can look up to and they can be a good example. But when we start relying upon our own wisdom in situations and the example of man, we will be sadly disappointed because we are not held to the standard of man, but to the standard of God's word, amen? And even though we do find some very good examples to emulate in the Bible, we must realize that our ultimate model for morality is Jesus Christ. Jesus is our example, the model, the pattern in which he wishes to design our lives after. He comes to confront the priest. And as he's telling him his business that he's on for the king, he asks the king, I need some food. Do you have any food? And the priest is like, well, we don't have any common bread, you know, that just everyone can have, but we have the show bread, the holy bread, the one that is consecrated before God. And he says... One little stipulation and ask him one little question. Look with me in chapter 21, it's verse 4. It says, And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have at least kept themselves from women. Then David continues his lie. Check this out. Then David answered the priest and said to him, Truly women have been kept from us. Remember, in the first lie, he says, Yes, we've, uh, we've been sent on business. And he refers to himself as he's with other people, but he's not. He's by himself, and he continues that same lie saying, Well, women have been kept from us. 
about three days since I came out, and these vessels of which young men are holy, <laughs> there he goes referring to multiple people, but it's just him, are holy, and the bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated in the vessel this day. So the priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread, which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. Did you know, a little fun fact for you, did you know that the average American tells one to two lies a day? You may not think that's a lot, but if you calculate that over the course of a year, that's about 365 to 730 lies a year. That's a lot of lies. That's average for an American. One to two lies. And in another study in 2002, a study conducted by the University of Massachusetts said that about 60% of adults can't have a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. <laughs> that, just kind of, that research just kind of backed up the situation with David. <laughs> Within a couple of verses, he's just continued lying twice. <laughs> And it's just kind of mind-blowing to think that, wow, what's wrong with us that we feel so afraid or so insecure that we have to lie to other people in a conversation, whether it's to a friend, family member, stranger? I mean, do we lie about how we're really doing just to make it sound like we're doing really good, or do we lie about how we're doing for other reasons? I mean, what's the, why do we have to lie about it? Like, I don't get the point of it. But have you ever been in that situation where you have just told a lie and, you know, just didn't think anything of it? I know I have. <laughs> Sometimes we like to justify it as, it was a little white lie. I mean, it was partial truth, you know. I mean, we try to justify these things out in our head. And I was convicted a lot of this as I started doing this sermon. <laughs> you know, and I'm realizing more and more as I get into ministry that God just keeps giving me sermons, not for the audience, but probably more for myself. <laughs> you know, he's trying to work out my own sanctification, you know. And I hope I can be transparent with you guys in that aspect, you know. Just want to be transparent because David wasn't transparent. There you go. Okay. But you know, it takes a lot more brain power to tell a lie than it does to tell the truth. Did you know that? I mean, think about all the, the calculating of the lie to the next lie or the manipulation and the fear of getting caught. You know, you're about to tell a lie and you're like, okay, how could this go? If I say this, they're gonna ask this question and then I have to come up with an answer for that. And then in order to perpetuate it, you have to keep on living that lie and keep on telling it and make sure you don't mess up the details of the lie you said previously so it's congruent and it's consistent with the next lie. I mean, it takes a lot of work to keep a lie going. Whew, it's exhausting, just tell the truth. The Bible says the truth will set you free. It may not set you free from consequence, but it will set your mind free from the guilt and shame. Did you know lying affects your brain? No joke. I read some scholarly journals this week, and uh, I tried to bring it down to layman's terms because that's how I understand it. I had to ask Ava a lot of questions. Hey, baby, what does this mean? I, I don't know. Google was my friend this week, and so was my, my wife um, in making this sermon. But check this out. I, I kind of condensed it. So it works like this. Inside your brain sits these two little almond-shaped structures called your amygdala. Ava made fun of me because I kept on saying agmodala. It's like, hey, baby, what's the agmodala? She's like, you mean amygdala? I'm like, <laughs> I'm a theology major. Sorry, baby. <laughs> so the amygdala, I even wrote it in here, amygdala, simple-minded person, which is pretty much the center of emotions, okay? And it plays a role in line, believe it or not. You know, the emotions of guilt and shame are housed uh, here, and when we experience um, about to lie or we're thinking about lying, it starts shouting at us, don't lie, don't lie, don't lie, don't do it. It's wrong. And it's warning us, don't do it, you know, because we start thinking about the guilt and shame or then when we have committed a lie or something, we start to feel the guilt and shame of it, okay? Then you have the prefrontal cortex. Medical people, keep me straight here because I've been really stressing out at this. Then you have the prefrontal cortex, which is where all the decision-making, problem-solving, moral judgment, and planning happens. And then the amygdala, oh, I did it. I knew I was going to do it. Amygdala interplays with the prefrontal cortex. Then there's the anterior cingulate cortex. What is that? It's a piece of your brain that lays between those two things, okay? <laughs> um, 
and it integrates both the decision making and the emotional regulation together, mixing in our experience of memory. All right, can I have a medical person nod their head? Did I do good so far? Okay, good, woo! Okay, I seriously was stressed out about that. I'm like, maybe I sit in front of an audience that has professionals who know stuff and I'm an unlearned man, okay. So, mixing in our experience of memory, and what is the experience of repeated lying, you may ask? Well, we desensitize our amygdala, which is the part that was shouting, no, don't do it! It's bad juju, don't do it! And then it makes it easier for you to lie because your brain starts to become desensitized to it. And then, you know, lies breed more lies. And when you think about pathological liars, maybe some of us know some of those, they are so desensitized that there is no voice shouting at them, or they've just become so, so numb that they don't even care about that little voice. Most likely there is no voice though, that they don't have the shame or guilt of telling a lie. Isn't that crazy? Like, I was just blown away. I was like, wow, I smell Smarticle today, man. I mean, this is great stuff. And it's like we can see scientifically the effects of sin upon our brain. You know, behind, beyond, you know, the physical effects of drugs and alcohol upon our brains and whatever it is, we actually see how a lion can affect our brain. And it just blew me away to think, wow, it actually changes you, changes who you are as a person when you start pursuing this route. And as I was researching this, I was reminded of what Mrs. White says in early writings when she, when she saw and described Satan. Check this out. This just blows my mind. You know, I remember my dad showing me this as a little boy, and then it came back to me. And check this out, early writings. Page 152 to 153, if you're curious about where that is. I was shown Satan as he once was, a happy, exalted angel. Then I was shown him as he now is. He still bears a kingly form. His features are still noble, for he is an angel fallen. But the expression of his countenance is full of anxiety, care, unhappiness, malice, hate, mischief, deceit, and every evil. Now check this next part out, check this out. The brow which was once so noble, the brow, I particularly noticed his forehead commenced from his eyes to recede. I saw that he had so long bent himself to evil that every good quality was debased and every evil trait was developed. Isn't that crazy? There was more to it, but it would have just got me sidetracked. And it's really ugly to see the rest of his description. But this is the description of the father of lies. Like that one part right there. Check this out. I love how she pays special attention to that, that the brow which was once so noble, I particularly noticed his forehead commenced from his eyes to recede. That means, in layman's terms, commence. It begins where his eyes are and it goes back. Like yeah, there's no frontal cortex there anymore. Like, it's completely wiped out. No more moral good judgment there. Like, completely gone. I said, wow, this is so crazy. Thinking about, like, the father of lives and all the things that he does, he's just got no sensitivity. No moral code, no conscious of doing right or wrong. It's just wrong, just bad. And I was like, wow, thanks. Thanks, Jesus, for giving this because it just continues to affirm like just the effects of how lying or just sin in general, and when we get used and used to sinning and it becomes habitual, like it changes you internally. And from what we're reading here, obviously physically, like that's just, it blows my mind. Sorry, a little tangent there, but I had to share that with you to just give you the picture, like, of the effects of sin. Going back to David, he receives the showbread, right? He gets the bread, and in one brief verse, we're introduced to Doeg, the Edomite, and he was a servant um, who was in charge of over uh, other servants of Saul, right? And we'll come back to him. 
But go to verse 8. Check this out. Verse 8, uh, chapter 21. It says, And David said to Ahimelech, Is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me. Here it is. Continuing lie, part 3. Because the king's business required haste. <laughs> this is comical to me, okay? This is very comical. He says, because the king's business requires haste. David, this whole time, has been uh, trying to avoid the king's business because the king's business was him and him being dead. You know, and there's some truth to this because, you know, the king wanted him dead with haste. So you got that part right, but he's continuing this lie. And he's like, I'm on hasty business. Well, the hasty business is me being dead. And so he continues this lie. And check this out. Ahimelech continues and says in verse 9, So the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that one here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. And you would think at that moment, if David wasn't already reminded to go to God when he retreated to the house of the Lord, it should have been at this moment when he received the sword of Goliath, the giant whom he slew with the help of God, that he should have remembered how God got him through that previous trial. He comes to another giant in his life. Now it's the fear of his own life and not against the enemy of the Israelite people. Now it's from the people on the same side as him. His life is at stake, and here he doesn't even think about it. He hears what the priest says, but we're not told he really remembers how he actually won that victory when he fought Goliath just a couple of chapters ago. And you know, just to bring this out, I don't know really how much time had passed from the time David slew Goliath to this very moment, but it doesn't seem like a whole lot of time had passed. I don't know if it was a matter of weeks or maybe a matter of months, but I'm reminded of that instant when Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem and then they forgot about Jesus. They forgot about Jesus and Jesus was left there and it took them three days to get back to find him. And we're told in inspiration that, oh, how much is our experience like this? I'm paraphrasing, that we can just lose sight of Jesus like that and it can sometimes take weeks or months to get back to where we were with him. And I see the same type of experience with David where He's lost sight. He's lost, taken his eyes off of God, and he's placed them upon himself and his circumstances, and he's trusting in his own abilities. I mean, this is David, the giant slayer, you know, the man of valor. Nothing, he's not afraid of anything, but yet, you know, he's still young, but he seems invincible, and now this is happening. It's like, what? What's happening? And it's not that God can't use a sword but remember, God used that very sword in the context of radical faith. David isn't displaying that faith. He's trusting in his own abilities to do it. And he's trusting more in the sword of Goliath than the sword of the Spirit. Do we do that at times? Do we trust more in the things that are physical rather than trusting in the sword of the spirit? We hang it up like it's an old rusty sword. Oh, we need a new one. Go, go get me a katana. Well, katana is not as good because it only has one side blade. The word of God is a double edged. Ha! But many times I can relate to this story in the fact that sometimes, yeah, we do put this up because we think we can fight better with other weapons other than the word of God. But may we say like David, except with the sword of the Spirit, there is none like it. Give it to me. Give it to me. Now we get to the next part, the part of consequence. Because there were and there are consequences to sin. Sometimes we don't always see or feel the effects of our sin. But in this case, 
there was a consequence. And sometimes, you know, we don't think a little lie could hurt anyone or do anything, right? And neither did David. David didn't think that telling a lie would really hurt him, but it would rather protect him from the truth of what was really happened. But he was very wrong. After he visits the priest in Nob, he flees to Adula, and then he, 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 goes, he goes to Gath first, sorry, he goes to Gath. He plays a madman. Then he goes to Adula, and then he goes to a forest in Hereth, and then Saul catches wind of where David is. Region, but not specific place. And he's calling the people, tell me where he is. I'll give you all this stuff if you just show me where David is. And guess who decides to show up again? Doeg. Doeg comes back. And go with me to chapter 22, verses 9 through 10. I'm sorry, chapter 7. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. <laughs> chapter 22, verse 9. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of ah Ahitab. And he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of, Goli of, that Phil of Goliath the Philistine. So the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Hittib, and the father, all his father's house, the priests who were in Nob, and they all came to the king. And Saul said, Here now, son of Ahitab. He answered, Here I am, my lord. Then Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword and inquired of God for him that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it is this day? Could you imagine having that accusation being before the king and being accused of conspiring against him? Woo. I honestly would be a little afraid. But here he is, the priest before the king. And, you know, Ahimelech helped David out of the honesty of his heart, thinking there's nothing wrong here. It's not like they had Facebook back then to, you know, <laughs> blast their drama all over the internet. Hey, we have a problem between David and uh, Saul. <laughs> Watch out. No, Ahimelech didn't know. And check this out, the consequences. Verse 15, it says, Did I then begin to inquire of the God for him? Far be it from me, to his servant or to anyone in my father's house. For your servant knew nothing of all this, little or much. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Wow. Like, he's just enraged, and he hates David so much, and he hates this situation so much that he's acting impulsively and rashly, and he's acting to this point that he's even raising his hand against the priest of God. And he says to the soldiers, go, slay the priest. But none of the, the soldiers want to do it. They fear God, and they fear the priest. And so what happens? He turns to Doeg, and Doeg, without hesitation takes the sword, and it says he starts killing the priests, and 85 priests die that day. Then he goes to Nod, and he destroys women and children and infants, and then livestock. And the irony is here is that Saul couldn't even do that with the Amalekites and King Agag, but yet he can do it with his own people. I just find that so crazy. He can't honor God, but he has to, he can't honor God in destroying a whole enemy, but he can destroy a whole people under Israel in order to preserve his own honor. Poor, poor Saul. The consequence of lying led to his death. One person got away, one person it says. Abathar, 
He ran and he told David about all that had happened, how Saul killed the Lord's priest, verse 22. So David said to Abathar, I knew that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have caused the death of the, all the persons of your father's house. At least David realized, at least David realized his sin. He realized his error. Mrs. White says this, going back to our whole theme of honesty is God's policy. She writes this about this specific moment. David's sin resulted in causing the death of the high priest. Had the facts been plainly stated, Ahimelech would have known what course to pursue to preserve his life. Check this out. This is a heavy hitter. This hit me. God requires that truthfulness shall mark his people even in the greatest peril. Even in the greatest peril, we are to remain truthful. Even if our life is at stake. And that's hard to swallow because the human impulse is want to prevent things from happening to those we love. The human impulses want to protect ourselves. But you know, there's something beautiful in this story that I just realized, and I just want to share this with you. You know, the death of Ahimelech reminds me of something. It reminds me that as David's lie led to the death of the priest, so did our sin lead to the death of Jesus, our heavenly high priest. Yet through Jesus' death for our sins, he made a way for reconciliation and the opportunity to be renewed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus can take the one whose mind has been deformed by sin and make it new. He can transform you and me. That's hope right there. And that's the good news of the gospel. So what is the faithful Christian to do when faced with a life or death situation? Be truthful. Going back to our initial story, Mrs. Hassel, trusting in God to bring about the best results, looked the soldier straight in the eye and said, As an officer of the German army, you know what your responsibility is, and you are welcome to carry it out. And with the culpability of the evil of his actions now fully on his shoulders, which it rightfully was and where it rightfully belonged, the Nazi turned on his heel and left that home undisturbed. (laughs) That's amazing. She didn't have to lie. And in this case, God preserved her. And when the time comes for us to make the decision of whether or not we lie or tell the truth, take no thought of the consequences, but ask yourself, what's God's will in this moment? What is God's will for you? My last quote from Mrs. White, she just had a lot to say and I just couldn't help but share it. She says this in reference to falsehood and even goes back to reformers. She says, even life itself should not be purchased with the price of falsehood. Even life itself should not be purchased with the price of falsehood. By word or a nod, the martyrs might have denied the truth and saved their lives. By consenting to cast a single grain of incense upon the idol altar, they might have been saved from the rack, the scaffold, or the cross. But they refused to be false in word or deed, though life was a boon they would receive by doing so. Imprisonment, torture, and death with a clear conscience, were welcomed by them. 
rather than deliverance on condition of deception, falsehood, and apostasy. And by fidelity and faith in Christ, they earned spotless robes and jeweled crowns. Their lives were ennobled and elevated in the sight of God because they stood firmly for the truth under the most aggravated circumstances. No matter how big the giants are that you may have defeated, when you move out of the presence of God, you are not safe. Remain truthful, remain faithful, for it's the requirement of God. He desires that from us. And that, my friends, is the truth about telling the truth. Honesty is God's policy. Let's pray. Father God, as I even hear the messages coming from my mouth, Lord, I, I see the challenge and I feel the challenge that is laid before us, Lord, to be truthful, to be honest. And that's difficult for us. Sometimes we can see how words can really hurt people, but sometimes, Lord, we, we, see, we see some type of some type of beauty, which isn't really beauty, of telling a lie to try to prevent someone from being hurt. But Lord, teach us to just say nothing at all if we can't tell the truth. Father, I pray that you would help us daily in the little moments of life where we are working out our salvation, where we are forming our characters. May we be faithful in the little aspects of our life so that when we come to these greater tests, Father, that we can remain faithful and truthful for your glory's sake. Lord, we surrender consequences into your hands. May we be more concerned about what your will is for our lives. This is our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. of our closing song. Let's sing hymn number 330, Take My Life and Let It Be.
Father, we pray that the song would be the prayer of our lives. Take our lives. Lord, and do the work that we cannot do for ourselves. And Father, when we're in that moment and we're tempted to just tell a little fib or a little lie, I pray that we would keep our tongue from evil. Please, Jesus. This is our prayer. We pray in your name. Amen.